So total welfare is the sum of the two. It's going to be A, B, C, D, E. OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to reduce output. Policies that achieve this are taxes, quotas, all kinds of policies, and we'll analyze those individually. But let's assume quantity goes down to Q double star. Now what we've got here now is we're producing Q double star units. Consumers are applying a price of, of P double star right here. So P double star being the price, demand curve being the downward sloping line still, and our range of consumption is going to be Q double star. Consumer surplus is just going to be A. Producer surplus here is going to be the area above supply, below this nice and high price right here, over the range of production, which is Q double star. So producer surplus is going to be B plus C. So total welfare is A, B, C. So consumer surplus goes from A, B, D to A. right? So consumers lose B and D, minus B, minus D. Producers used to have C and E. right? Now they have B and C. So they lose E, they gain B. So plus B, minus E. And overall welfare changed from, well, the consumer surplus was this big triangle right here before. Producer surplus was this big triangle here before. Now consumer surplus went to little a. Producer surplus was B and C. So what we went from is this big triangle right here that starts here, goes all the way up there and out here, to this area right here. So we lose D and E in terms of welfare. So I'm sorry, there's a line here. So change is minus D minus E. So society loses D and E in terms of total welfare from producing less than the perfectly competitive outcome. This thing has a very threatening name. Deadweight loss, right? Uh, or DWL. So if you produce less than the perfectly competitive outcome and the market isn't perfectly competitive, you have deadweight loss. You have loss of welfare that nobody uh, recovers. Now, I'm going to do a really mean thing. Uh, I'm not going to show you what happens if you produce more than the perfectly competitive outcome, but I'm going to make you do that at home. All right? So what you should do is do the following. Right? Draw the perfectly competitive picture, force quantity to be out here, all right? and figure out what deadweight loss is going to be in this market. Right? Do the same consumer producer surplus picture here and show that there is deadweight loss. And there is. And I'm going to do that at the beginning of next lecture to show you how it works. But if I do this for you here, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that was easy. Uh, I can do that on an exam. And trust me, that's one of the hardest pictures and hardest graphs to draw right here. But it really tests several aspects of your understanding of what consumer surplus is, what producer surplus is, and what the relevant quantities and prices are. All right? So try it until Thursday. Uh, before, no, what's today? Tuesday? Yeah. So try it tonight or tomorrow, and I'll do that at the beginning of next lecture, but I really want you to try it. So there's deadweight loss if we produce less than the perfectly competitive output. I'm telling you, and you will convince yourself, and then I'm going to tell you again, that the same thing happens if you produce more than the perfectly competitive output. So if you lose by producing less than, and if you lose if you produce more than the perfectly competitive outcome, what this means is if the market is perfectly competitive, the outcome the market will reach, if left alone, is the socially optimal outcome using this measure of welfare. Right? The trick here, and I'm seeing a lot of these uh, foreheads, lines across foreheads right here. I don't like that at all, Max. I'm Berkeley. That's a statement that doesn't go with what I think is true. Uh, what I did not say is that any market left alone will reach the socially optimal outcome. That is not true at all in most cases ever. All right? But perfectly competitive markets left alone, you will only make them the pie smaller if you actually interfere in these perfectly competitive markets. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple more examples here, and then we're going to let markets fail. And I'm going to show you that interfering in certain markets actually allows government to increase the amount of total welfare uh, in a society. So that'll be pretty exciting and more consistent uh, with many people's beliefs. Uh, not others, but we're all entitled to our opinions. But what I'm telling you is, of course, always right. right? Uh, OK, so this leads, of course, to this notion that we all read lots of op-eds about. I stopped reading most op-eds. Uh, it's really depressing, because most op-ed writers don't understand any economics whatsoever. But uh, government policies, if you have a perfectly competitive market, if your market is truly perfectly competitive, meaning no monopoly, no oligopoly, no externalities, no public goods, no asymmetric information, no uncertainty, no high transactions costs, and all the other good things uh, that we're, we're talking about. No product differentiation, for example. So you're just selling toothpaste, not you know, uh, Colgate sparkly with baking soda and, I don't know, vitamin D in it. Uh, so let's assume that some markets uh, are perfectly competitive and see uh, what happens if government intervenes. Okay? The things I want to talk about are three specific things. The first one is I want to limit the number of firms in the market and see what that does to welfare. Then I want to look at what taxes do to welfare. And then everybody's favorite when you see it and everybody's most hated concept when you actually have to do it is look at some trade policies and see what that does to domestic and foreign uh, welfare. So let's work through these. This will take a little while. Uh, I'm also going to sneak in a price floor and a price ceiling there, uh, but it's just going to give us a nice workout on using consumer and producer surplus here for a little while. All right, so let's get right to it. So do we limit the number of taxi cabs in a market? Anybody here from New York? Do you limit the number of taxi cabs in New York City, yellow cabs? Yeah, so there was a, a, so you have to have a medallion, right, to operate a taxi cab in New York City. Uh, those medallions, there was one that sold for a million dollars, right? They're incredibly valuable uh, things. If you have the right to operate a cab in New York City, uh, you need that medallion. Now, there's a company, it's my favorite company in the world because it has an umlaut in it, and I'm German. So there's this company called Uber. Now, you guys are too young to, to, to remember Mike Myers, amazing, uh, making fun of my people. Uh, but uh, so Uber is a company uh, that you have an app on your cell phone, and you hit a button, you can select what type of car you want, the Chevy Suburban or a cab or something else. Uh, they pinpoint your location, they show up, they send you a picture of who your driver is, and you can text message or call the driver and talk to them, they pick you up, they have your credit card on file, and they drop you off wherever you want to go, right? Uh, so, Totally different model from a taxi cab where taxis sort of randomly drive around town and you flag one down. Right? Are taxi cab drivers fighting Uber and Uber type companies in these markets? Really badly. They'd love to take and, and, and run them off the road, pretty much. Only a Ford Crown Vic against a Chevy Suburban Ford Crown Vic loses. All right? uh, the, I've written a paper about that, so I'm not just saying that. But the point here is there's got to be a reason that limiting the number of firms is valuable to producers. Otherwise, these taxi cab medallions wouldn't sell for a million dollars, and taxi cab companies wouldn't be incredibly upset that Uber and these other companies are entering these markets. By the way, I don't want to come across as somebody who's pushing a product because, of course, other companies would do the same thing, but Uber seems to be the one that has the own lap, so I'm using that one. Uh, so, why is that? Important, why does this matter? What consumer surplus, what producer surplus? Explain, Max. All right, let me do exactly just that. Sounds a tough one to draw. Okay, so what I'm going to assume is we have a market, long run, 
Uh, I have free entry and exit uh, for now. I have identical firms. So Envision, Ford Crown, Victoria. Smells really bad. Uh, person at the wheel doesn't know where they're going, uh, but they're all identical. All right. Uh, cost of operation is exactly the same. Uh, free entry and exit and constant cost. Right. So if we produce more taxi cabs, it's not going to increase the price of gas in the market where we're looking at, for example. So what does this mean? Well, each individual firm has an average cost curve that looks something like this. And it has a marginal cost curve that looks something like this. I don't like that marginal cost curve. Let me draw that again. Better. Not great, but better. OK, dollars, quantity. So we have a marginal cost curve. We have an average variable cost curve. As soon as the price reaches minimum average variable cost, this is the same picture Kyle drew for you last time, the firm's going to enter production and here produce Q1 units. All right? So the supply curve here, first cab produces Q1 units. If we need more aggregate output, is that cab going to drive more hours? Or in the world of free entry and exit, is another cab going to enter the market? Other cab enters market, right? Because in order to get this cab to produce more, you would have to pay it more dollars, right? Because the only way for this cab to produce more is if you walk up the marginal cost curve. So uh, this cab would charge you that for more output. Another cab entering would just produce Q1 at this lower cost. So what you simply get is 2Q1, 3Q1, 4Q1, and so on. So this here is the long run supply curve in a world of free entry and exit. So 5, 6, seven, let's do it at 6 here, OK? 6Q1. So now I'm going to limit the number of taxi cabs to 6, OK? So this city, uh, let this be Greenfield, Massachusetts, one of the most wonderful uh, cities in the Berkshires, uh, says only six cabs in this market. So what does this do to the long-run supply curve? Well, up to six cabs, right? it's still flat. But after six cabs, what happens? Can more firms enter? The answer starts with N. And N's an O, right? No, right? because if you limit the number of firms to six, no more cabs can enter after six are in the market, assuming enforcement. So if you want to produce more than six Q1 units of cab rides, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to raise the price in order to get the existing cabs to produce more output. All right. So if I want each cab to produce, let's say, Q2 units of output, I'm going to have to pay them this many dollars. Okay, So if this here is P1, then this here is P2. So now at P2 right here, each one of these cabs produces Q2. And since Q2 is greater than 1, let's say this is roughly here. Each cab produces Q2 units. There are six cabs. All right? So what this means for my long-run supply curve now, after this limiting of firms, at 6Q1, right? up until 6Q1, it's still nice and flat. But at exactly 6Q1, it's going to start going up like this. All right? So this is long-run supply prime, where now I've limited the number of firms to six firms in this particular market. Max, you're boring me to tears. Kyle told me this. He was funnier, better looking, and clearer than you are. Fully agree. But he didn't tell you about consumer and producer uh, surplus in this particular market. And I'm going to tell you exactly that and why it's perfectly rational for taxi cab, fighters, uh, ca taxi cab companies to fight for uh, regulations that limit the number of taxi cabs in a, in a market. So let's do it. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a demand curve. I need a third color. It's getting intense. Okay? So if, let's say, the demand curve is this, right? then my equilibrium quantity in the earlier market is going to be right here, uh, this equilibrium quantity, let's call this Q star. And the equilibrium price is going to be P1, which we're going to call P star. If I limit the number of firms, the equilibrium quantity is going to be somewhere here. Let's call this Q double star. Oh, 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 boo. I'm going too fast, and I'm showing you wrong stuff. This is terrible. Slow down, Max. Focus. What's the equilibrium quantity in the market? Max, you know what it is. It's where quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied, not the nonsense you just drew. All right? Uh, quantity supplied in the market with limited taxi cabs is the blue line. Quantity demanded is given by my demand curve. So where those two lines cross, that's equilibrium quantity and price. Close one. I'll bring you a pound of chocolate or two next time for that one. That was bad. OK. So equilibrium quantity, now after limiting the number of firms, is going to be Q double star. It's lower than before. But what happens to price? Price went up to P double star. OK. So let's draw some pizza slices. OK? The pizza slices I'm going to need are the following pizza slices. I'm going to use this big triangle A right here. OK? Big triangle A is going to be this area right there, area above uh, P double star. And there should be two stars on here. Uh, area B right here is going to be this Massachusetts-like looking thing right here. And area C is going to be this little triangle down here. Okay? A, big triangle. B, Massachusetts without Cape Cod. And C here, little uh, triangle. So let's look at consumer and producer surplus with and without this regulation. Okay? So at Q star, uh, which is the market left below, no limit of the number of firms, what's price? It's P star. right? This is price. We're consuming Q star cab rides. right? Uh, and this is the demand curve. So consumer surplus is the area above price over this range of production below demand. So it's going to be A, B, and C. A, B, C. What about producer surplus? Well, this is price, the red line. This is also the long run supply curve. So price is exactly equal to long run supply. Is there any producer surplus here? Any profit? None, right? So no profit for producers. So welfare is A, B, C. Now what about Q double star? All right, let's do it again. Consumer surplus. Area above price. Now price is at P double star. It's higher. We're consuming Q double star units, and it's the area under the demand curve. So consumer surplus is A. What's producer surplus? It's the area, you're right, thank you. Uh, it's the area above supply over the range of production below price. So it's going to be B. 
What's total welfare? A plus B. So who loses? Consumers had A, B, and C in consumer surplus. Now they have A. So they lose B and C. Producers had no producer surplus, but now they're getting B. So producers, by this regulation, are grabbing B dollars of consumer surplus from consumers and turning it into profits for themselves. At what cost to society? C, right? We lose C. So C here, this area right here, is dead weight loss. Right? So what limiting the number of firms does in the long run here is it turns a flat long run supply curve into one that's slightly upward sloping towards the end there. And it turns the market from one where consumers had A, B, and C dollars worth of consumer surplus into one where consumers now have A dollars and producers capture this slice B here in terms of profits. Who do you think, just I have one more minute. Who do you think gets the rents or gets these profits? Is it the drivers? No. Who gets those profits? The owners of the medallions, right? So this is a really good way for owners of medallions to accrue or essentially capture rents uh, by lobbying for regulation. So it's perfectly rational for owner of taxi cab companies to lobby for minimizing the number of firms in the market. I will see you on Thursday.